everybody and welcome. Um, as usual, I would like to just remind you to take a moment to acknowledge the land that you are joining us from. We are running this virtually, but we are uh, currently located at York University. And York University recognizes that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories on which York University campuses are located, and that these relationships precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. And this area known as Tukuranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region on which we are situated. It gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce Harold Plowder, who's from just down the street, and we had hoped that he would be here in person. Unfortunately, um, current circumstances being what they are, we are doing this virtually. But Harold Bowder is a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies and the Graduate Program in Immigration and Settlement Studies at Toronto Metropolitan University. He's the director of the International Partnership Project, Urban Sanctuary, Migrant Solidarity and Hospitality in Global Perspective. And he's the author of a book that he's going to be speaking to us about today, From Sovereignty to Solidarity. His talk today is From Sovereignty to, Sovereignty to Solidarity, National versus Urban Approaches to Migration. It is with great pleasure that I ask you to welcome Harold Bonner. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. I'm located in this in the same, just down the street, as you said. Um, so thank you very much for the land acknowledgement. It applies to me too. And I think especially in the context when we talk about migration um, and settlement immigration, I think it's very important to um, to become aware um, what the relationship is to the land um, and to people who have been here before. Um, so I, I'm gonna give a presentation um, and I do have visuals. So if um, we could share this, then, uh, then we can get started. Okay, there we are. Well, thank you. Um, yes, it is unfortunate that we can't do this in person. I would have loved to come out to um, to York University and see everyone. But I, this is one of these situations where we want to be careful. We have done this for the last two and a half years. So we're going to do it again just to make sure that everyone is safe. Um, so the, the, re the, the book actually has a slightly different um, subtitle than the presentation today because I think the presentation subtitle is actually more descriptive. But what's really about is thinking about different ways of how, how we can conceptualize migration because the sovereign nation state has been has been very prominent i think in the way that we think about migration um i wrote this book uh during COVID, um and um i think the we, we were many of us were thinking that the global pandemic really presents an opportunity to put a reset button in many ways and actually, very interestingly, the morning I was starting to write on the book, I think that was in January or about, about two years ago, um, there was a, an opinion piece in the Toronto Star. And the author here argued, and this, this is a quote, um, we can't retreat inside our borders and tinkering at the edges of the current system is not enough. What we need is something new, transformative, and he was talking specifically about how um, we manage or fail to manage as a global community and to, um, to, to manage COVID. Um, and then he continues in this obit, um, he continues to argue, and again, another quote, we need, we need fewer borders, uh, more cooperation and increased connections. And then tackling today's global issues requires, another quote, a much greater deal of global cooperation, alignment, and solidarity, end of quote. And then he continues, quote, a new paradigm is needed um, to pragmatically meet collective challenges. 
And finally, he says, quote, cities have done admirable work organizing internationally um, to address these challenges. So these were the quotes um, in which the author tried to address um, the pandemic and solving some of the issues that, that came along with the pandemic. Um, and I think in, during the pandemic, we have seen um, that national self-interest can be hurting all of us, um, that nations are failing to solve you know, some problems, um, not only controlling the, the spread of the virus, but also other things like climate change, pollution, global poverty, exploitation, and, and, and so forth. And I think the same thing um, applies to migration and refugee protection, that we have the nation state and the nation states, the Westphalian system is failing in many ways. And we need to, there's an opportunity maybe to, to rethink how we should think about migration. Uh, next, the next slide, please. My overarching thesis, so the overarching thesis um, of the book where that I started out with is that power has always controlled human mobility. Um, that has been like that uh, in the nomadic um, hunter and gather, gatherer societies in the feudal system. Um, during slavery here, the image shows one of the gates of no return at the coast of Ghana through which enslaved Africans were forcefully brought to, to the Americas. And today it's a territorial nation state that seeks to control human mobility. But also we see that people are trying to circumvent these state controls. Um, and I think that offers an opportunity to rethink human mobility. If I could have the next slide, please. So, I think in the book, what, what I'm offering is, a, is an optimistic outlook. I, I'm, I'm offering a critique and then a solution. The first one is the critique of national sovereignty. So this, this Westphalian type of sovereignty. I'm gonna say a few things more about that in a minute. And I ask, how did we end up with a territorial sovereign state that is able to claim sovereignty to keep people from moving freely? And then as a solution, kind of hinting towards the solution, I'm going to explore the idea of solidarity. And I'm going to use the example of the solidarity city, which defines um, a concrete kind of context in which migration and refugee solidarity can actually be observed. Next slide, please. So the concept of sovereignty. Sovereignty is a, a term, an idea that emerged in Europe during the Enlightenment period. And so it is in a way inherently Eurocentric. And it's not to be confused with another kind of literature that we see, but that we hear much more um, about um, recently, indigenous sovereignty, um, which recognizes the interdependencies and, and social and political context. Um, the Eurocentric, the Westphalian type of sovereignty is a very different one. It's very much tied to the, to the nation state. Um, I call it, as I just mentioned, the Westphalian sovereignty, which reflects a Cartesian kind of logic of territoriality. Um, and by that, I mean that the territorial nation state divides the surface of the earth into, or according to the system, this Westphalian system, we're dividing the surface of the earth into mutually exclusive territorial territories, which is depicted on, on the picture here. Next slide, please. And to understand the Westphalian state and how it regulates migration, I, I took an empirical look at, at one of the events that are supposed to be sort of the milestone of the development of, of the Westphalian system. And those were the treaties that were signed in 1648 in, in, German, in two German cities, Münster and Osnabrück. Um, these treaties ended the 30 years war. And here in the image, we see actually one of the chambers of peace or the chamber of peace, the city hall of Osnabrück, where um, part of the treaty or one of the treaties was signed. Um, of course, that's a bit of a simplification. The modern nation state was not created in a single document. It was more of a long process from feudalism to modern statehood. 
However, we, I think we can look at the treaties to give us an indication, sort of a snapshot in time, how the state treated migration during this transition period, right, right when, the, when the Westphalian state emerged. And I did look at the treaties and how my, what it said about migration and how people should mi migrate. And, and I was actually quite surprised to find um, that the treaties specified or they granted permission to people to immigrate um, especially people with different religions. Um, the Thirty Years' War was a religious, was a religious war, um, and then um, it needed to regulate if you're from a different religion than, than the, um, the prince or the, um, the, the ruler, the king, um, that you are able to, to leave the place, uh, leave the territory. So it granted permission to emigrate to people with different religious denominations and the sovereign. It also, the treaty protected the property of immigrants, so people leaving. It regulated the return um, of refugees of war, so enabled people who, who were refugees, who were fleeing the war, to return to their places of origin. It granted safe passage to people um, for the purpose of trade. And then it also restricted exit fees that, could, that a sovereign could charge. So what I noticed in the treaties is that the treaties explicitly enabled migration and specified how migration ought to occur. And what I've inferred from that is that the norm was actually that subjects, um, people that were subject to the sovereign, um, they, were, they were immobile. So then the norm, the default was that nobody could move but the treaties actually had to specify in the which circumstances people can emigrate, move, pay exit fees, and so forth. Um, so the modern territorial nation state really continues to control migration. Um, but there has also been over time, um, over the last few centuries, a legal shift from exit controls, so controlling who can leave a territory, towards entry controls. Um, but nevertheless, the idea that um, a nation state or a sovereign can control my migration and the mobility of people, that has stayed the same. And that was my beginning thesis that power has always um, controlled mobility. Um, and next slide, please. So, and that's also framing our, our conventional thinking that the sovereign Westphalian nation state controls migration. But in the context of the modern state, we can also reverse the logic of this thinking and examine how controlling migration enables this Westphalian state to enact itself as sovereign to begin with. And a good example here would be the United States. Uh, already in 1776, the Declaration of Independence explicitly mentioned the King of Great Britain and how he refused to increase immigration as a reason um, why the US should seek um, independence or the, the, the states at the time should, should seek independence. So the US or the, the, the states needed migration to become a sovereign settling colonial state to begin with. Um, later, immigration policy of um, of the United States began to violate its own constitutional principles of equality and liberty. So we had the Page Act, for example, of, of 1875 and the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Um, so we had legislation that um, violated openly and directly um, the, the Constitution. More recently, of course, there was Trump's um, Muslim ban or um, and I also found on, on Twitter um, from then Vice President Mike Pence an interesting tweet as the caravan of refugees was approaching the US. Um, uh, the tweet was um, that this is a blatant disregard for our border and our sovereignty. And it illustrated that uh, that tweet illustrated how um, migration can be a challenge of, uh, towards sovereignty. And then the planet, plenary doctrine, power, uh, the plenary power doctrine, um, permits uh, migration policy to openly contradict um, and violate the U.S. country constitution. Um, so the state, through immigration policy, can say um, 
sense. When it comes to migration policy, I don't really have to observe any kind of moral or legal principles or human rights or anything like that. I can act in entirely independently from my own moral or legal obligations. In other words, um, through migration policy, the state can enact itself as sovereign. Sovereign meaning I don't have to pay attention to anyone else. I can do what I want. Um, so, so what I'm trying to do here is showing that today, as in feudal times and before then, control over human mobility is a tool to rule over territory and people. Um, and today, it's the idea of sovereignty that, le that legitimates this control. So what about a different non-state-centric frame? a frame of, of, of thinking about human mobility. And that then brings me to the idea of solidarity. And I think it's interesting to, to juxtapose the, the concept of sovereignty and solidarity. And it's actually not that far-fetched when you look at the migration literature, for, exa for example, or what's going on um, in migration policy and, and, and actions um, at the moment. There are lots of examples where states repress solidarity. For example, um, in, in Europe, I'm thinking about action against sea rescue operations in the Mediterranean, um, or, or um, uh, the state um, acting against church asylum, or trying to prevent um, humanitarian assistance at, at the border, for example. So apparently this solidarity challenges the Westphalian state. So it's very interesting that there's, a, that there's a tension between the two ideas and concepts. But in the next slide, please, um, we can um, yeah, discuss or spend more time on the concept of, of solidarity. It has played a quite important role, I think, in shaping Western um, democratic societies. Um, but unlike sovereignty, the concept of solidarity acknowledges that no person or any kind of state can act entirely independently. I think it's in, in the context of solidarity, it's always about making a connection with other people and recognizing these interdependencies. Like sovereignty, however, solidarity is also a very Eurocentric concept. It emerged in Europe. Um, but it also escapes a single definition. That's what's shown in, in this graphic here. I, I looked with a graduate student, a graduate student, her name is uh, Laurel Jobs, at the concept of solidarity. Now you can go back, yeah, thank you. Um, in Specifically in the migration refugee uh, literature. And we found a very interesting kind of um, a typology that is subdividing the different kinds of uses into a non-enlightenment tradition and an enlightenment tradition. And the enlightenment tradition really goes back to a, a range of different philosophers that have um, looked at uh, solidarity in, in, in different ways. Um, and I'm not going to get into this type typology. We don't have time for that. Um, but for my purposes, of this presentation today, the last one in the right-hand corner here, um, the recognitive solidarity is the most important. And in this case, solidarity refers to, to a transformative social practice and a so solidarity that creates new political subjectivity. So very much in the Hegelian Marxian kind of, kind of way. Um, if we have, can have the next slide, please. Um, and I can just give you a historical example of the kind of solidarity that, that I'm talking about. Um, and here we see in the image the labor movement, or one of the factories out of which the labor movement emerged in Europe. Karl Marx um, theorized uh, that the working class exists as a social fact, so in itself. Um, but this working class needed to acquire collective identity to become a political force, so existing for itself. And solidarity helps achieve this aim, this aim of not only transformation, but also subject formation. Um, also, so it's not only the working class, but solidarity. There's also a, a large literature on the importance of solidarity and solidarity movements in anti-colonial struggles, for example. Um, in which case, interestingly, solidarity also connects different places 
um, and crosses national borders in both of which Marx talked about the, inter the international, um, that it's not solidarity within the nation state, but between nations crossing borders. In a very interesting book on solidarity, um, David Featherstone used the example of the cotton bl um, blockade in the 19th century, where factory workers in Manchester, where the cotton was processed, acted in solidarity with the enslaved people in the American South, where cotton was grown and produced. And today we are confronting different kinds of challenges. Um, in a Westphalian system, um, territorial states control human mobility, but people also resist this control. Um, and in that context, human mobility forges solidarity among and with migrants and refugees and between migrants and refugees. And that's what I'm, I've been interested in in, in the book. Um, so when people migrate, when they flee from, or when they flee from war, disaster, or poverty, they also connect places. Um, people engage with each other and they learn through each other's um, problems in different parts of the world. So solidarity is also something that connects different places across borders. And it's an example in the next slide that is very prominent in the literature, um, the Hotel City Plaza in Athens. It doesn't exist anymore, the building still exists anymore, but the, but the, um, the idea um, kind of lives on, but it's not, uh, it's not the same hotel anymore. It's a formerly abandoned hotel and it functioned between 2016 and 2019 as a place that offered refuge and solidarity to, to, to refugees. It offered housing and quote, a solidarity space um, as that those were the, that's a, the words of Valeria Raimondi um, for hundreds of migrants and refugees. Most of them came from Afghanistan and Syria. And they called itself um, the best hotel in Europe as you could see in, the, in, in, in this image here. And if you can see the small print, uh, it also said that it had no pool, no mini bar, no room service, but yet it was the best hotel in, in Europe because it also had a self-organized kindergarten, a pharmacy, a library, a shared canteen. It offered services such as medical care, a legal aid clinic, language classes, had hotel security, and it was all self-organized in this solidarity space. While it existed, City Plaza was a site of social and political transformation. And that, um, that kind of reflects the idea of the recognitive solidarity, solidarity that, that transforms society and creates new kind of, kinds of sub subjectivities. Um, and City Plaza, I think, illustrates how this kind of solidarity manifests itself in very concrete places. So we have a building um, where people meet, where they interact with each other, where they talk with each other, and where this solidarity is being forged. Um, so that's one example. Another example, of course, where or another concrete space where um, the solidarity is, exists and emerges um, is the city in general. And that brings me to the final theme of the presentation. If I could have the next slide which is the Solidarity City. Um, cities are concrete places where people interact with each other, where we talk, talk over the fence with our neighbors, where our kids go to school with, with our neighbor's kids and other kids, where they meet each other, where they play and where we play, we adults play, um, where people are politically active. Um, where they go to work and that defines their activity spaces. So it's really a concrete, um, tangible community. Whereas um, Benedict Anderson, for example, talked about the nation state and Chuck's position to that as an imagined community because people don't know each other. In the urban space, you could argue this is, an, a, this is a tangible, concrete community. And I can, I suggest, or at least I explore that cities could, or whether cities can, present a counter model to this Westphalian type of sovereignty in dealing with human mobility. Um, 
And this counter model, I think, might enable us to rethink migration, reimagine inclusion, and reframe community membership and belonging. Um, when it comes to solidarity cities, there are really four dimensions that define such cities. And solidarity cities, uh, those are cities that in the North American context would be, for example, would be known more as, as sanctuary cities. Um, but I, I would treat sanctuary cities are a particular kind of incarnation of, of this idea of the solidarity city where um, uh, cities really have a, a very particular and distinct approach towards defining community and inclusion. Um, so I looked at solidarity cities and, and sanctuary cities in particular um, empirically and what are the, the kind of common characteristics. And I found that often these cities have a legal kind of aspect or dimension to it, where there's a, a municipal legislative body that commits um, to, um, to the idea of being a solidarity city, being inclusive. Um, in Toronto, for example, city council voted on such a resolution in, in 2013. Um, there's a discursive dimension uh, that includes local efforts to, to re-script exclusionary national migration and refugee discourses towards something that is more inclusive, where we see that and re-script it as, as migration ref, um, being positive, maybe. Or maybe not even positive, but perfectly normal. Um, there's an identity aspect uh, where solidarity cities imagine themselves as space of belonging, independent of national status and whether the national status or whether the nation state says a person belongs or does not belong. And then there's a scalar aspect that mobilizes municipal and local civic civil society infrastructure. For example, here in the image, we see a drop-in center for illegalized migrants and refugees in Palermo and in Sicily, Italy. Um, but also the entire city municipal administrations, for example, um, the city of Toronto that um, supports these kind of policies and, and ideas of being a sanctuary city. Um, there are also other characteristics that can be found within these cities. If I could have the next slide, please. I think we had this one. We need to write. Thank you. Um, so empirically, I also found that top-down and bottom-up approaches tend to converge in these cities. Um, an activist that I interviewed referred to the ping pong game between grassroots activists and municipal administrations that goes back and forth, very much like a, like a dialectical kind of um, political process. Um, they also follow, tend to follow a domicile principle of belonging. So if you are here, if you're living within our community, of course you belong. Does it matter whether you have a particular national status? No, to us it does. You're here and therefore you're, you're, you belong to our community. And that differs from a Westphalian principle of inclusion that is very tight very much tied to having national citizenship or not. Um, and then solidarity is not always repro reproducing the Cartesian um, or container logic that characterizes the Westphalian nation state, even though to a degree it does. When you look at a city like Toronto, there is a municipal boundary to, to Toronto, but that doesn't mean that always solidarity ends at the municipal boundary. Um, that was actually one of the critiques of another person that I that I interviewed. It was in the southern German city of, of Freiburg, and they have an image of their Solidarity City campaign, very much, very similar to Toronto's image of the Solidarity City City campaign too. And it's a it's a circle around the city. Um, and she said there was an activist um, that was heavily heavily involved in the campaign itself, and she didn't like the logo, and she said. This is a quote. I find it a bit scary. Um, there are sanctuary cities and a hostile surrounding area. That's the kind of idea that she critiqued um, as represented in the, in, in the logo. We adopted the logo, but we understood it from the very beginning as very restrictive and didn't think it was such a nice idea to be in a circle um, fenced in by surrounding houses. 
And her idea of, in the entire campaign, the idea of solidarity was not confined to a territorial space that has a boundary, but it really leapfrogged across the municipal boundaries. Instead, solidarity um, yeah, reaches out and connects different places, especially this urban um, solidarity with migrants and refugees. Um, there are, for example, urban networks connecting different cities with, with each other. There's a Euro, Euro cities um, solidarity city network, uh, Barcelona, Berlin, Zurich, other places are, are part of that. And um, there's an international cities of refuge network that has a global reach. In Latin America, there are Suidades Solidarias um, and, and other networks. So we see that cities are networked with each other, not within a particular, not within their own boundaries and not within a national um, container. But then there's also very interesting interurban initiatives. In, in Germany, there's a very interesting initiative It's called Seebrücke, Seabridge. Um, and this is um, where municipalities are declaring a willingness um, to accept refugees from other countries. So that a place, a, a municipality in Germany says, yes, we as an urban community, we would like to kind of cut out the nation state as a, as a middle, middle person and accept um, refugees directly um, from the refugee camps in, um, in, in Greece or directly from the sea, op sea rescue operations in the Mediterranean or wherever um, there's need um, for, for people to come here. So in this case, in this initiative, we see a connection or we see a connection between places and how solidarity is not limited to the city boundary. So if I could have the next slide, please. And we, we do see cities that have these kind of characteristics and have this kind of attitude and approach towards inclusion of migrants and refugees, we find them in, in, in almost everywhere in the world. Um, but they're not, they're, they have different labels and different names. So they're not, they're not always called solidarity cities, they're not always called sanctuary cities, but they have different names. But there's some common understanding of what an urban community is in the, in the common approach, um, how we can um, address um, the movement of people. Uh, so in Latin, in, in Anglo America, for example, we use the term sanctuary city. That's very common. Not everybody uses it. Some municipalities actually reject it strategically, but that seems to be the, the, the concept, the, the, the terminology that is that is established in North America. Um, there's a history too. I'm not going to get into it too much, um, uh, but it started in North America with actually in during the Vietnam War, where the city of Berkeley offered sanctuary to soldiers resisting going to the war. And then in the 80s, the city of San Francisco in California prohibited the use of municipal resources to assist um, federal immigration enforcement. And then there was a series of other kind of events and it snowballed from here in 2007, for example, the new sanctuary movement focused on illegalized migrants, so migrants without status, who are already living in US cities and try to create a, um, uh, an environment that is more safe for them and more inclusive. Um, that kind of idea then leapfrogged again across the border to Canada and Toronto in 2013 committed to be a city like that, even though it didn't use um, explicitly and officially the idea of sanctuary city, it really enacted similar policies. Um, and in the UK, there's um, and a movement, a cities of sanctuary um, movement that focuses more on offering hospitality rather than, than legal protection, but it uses the same kind of terminology, the sanctuary city idea. In continental Europe, there's a whole range of, uh, of diverse um, initiatives and they all depend of course on, on different legal national circumstances and, and geopolitical contexts and, and, and people um, or the, the movement of people that, that differ in different circumstances, geographical circumstances. One of the prime example would be the, 
um, the city of Barcelona in Catalonia, and that has been at, at, the, at the forefront of some of these initiatives in, in Europe. It went under the label city of refuge or refuge city, so it uses um, a different different terminology, but still there's a common urban approach that differs from that of the nation state. Um, there are a bunch of German cities, um, Freiburg, Berlin, for example, that embrace the label of solidarity city. Um, and in the context of a, of a project, of a larger project that's going on right now, our colleagues in Europe have been mapping some of these initiatives, and we find that there are dozens and dozens of different initiatives that have different terminologies and that all look differently and have different um, activities and um, do things a bit differently. But nevertheless, there's an urban approach towards addressing um, issues of migration, refugees, um, issues of exclusion and inclusion. In Latin America, there's also initiatives um, spearheaded by UNHCR that established Suidades Solidarias, Solidarity Cities. And there are several municipalities alone in the, in, in the region of Santiago de Chile, for example, that um, follow these principles. We can also look in Africa. Africa has a bit of a different situation because often we have weak Westphalian states and weak municipalities often as well. We have also maybe also a more transient migration, whereas migration is not conceived, at least um, in all cases, as a destination, um, but more of a transient kind of um, mobility of, of people. But nevertheless, a recent book by Deres Kassa, for example, calls Nairobi Africa's preeminent sanctuary city even though it didn't have the legal dimension, so there was no city council committing to be a sanctuary city. Um, through empirical research, CASA established that, well, then there are a number of, of characteristics that Nairobi really looks like a solidarity type of city. In South Africa, there's a literature on civil society actors supporting illegalized migrants um, that also makes um, Johannesburg to a degree, look like a sanctuary city, a solidarity city, even though that term is not used. In Asia, Antje Misbach and her colleagues uh, call the Indonesian city of Makassar, um, a quote, sanctuary city, um, even though local initiatives are mostly funded by, I, uh, by the IOM. So it's, it's more of a top-down approach than a bottom-up approach. Um, there's also literature on, on Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, um, where local civic society actors collaborate with, with UNHCR to provide services to illegalized migrants. In Turkey, we observe that some municipalities oppose national governments to assist refugees um, with temporary protect protection and so forth. So we see in different parts of the world, we see similar kind of initiatives at the urban scale. And I find that very interesting um, how cities are stepping up to the plate. Um, and not only stepping up to the plate to support migrants and refugees, um, but also often challenge the Westphalian approach um, towards migration controls. Um, I also wanted to, you see this logo here, I wanted to draw attention to a new international partnership project. Uh, and of course, the Center for Refugee Studies at York is also a partner in this project. So I wanted to mention it. Um, we call it Solar City. Um, it's, a, it's a large international partnership which brings together academics and practitioners from Africa, Latin America, Europe, and Canada and the US um, with one of the goals being to yeah, look at internationally these sanctuary city solidarity city initiatives, but also um, address the Eurocentrism ingrained in our theories and practices. Um, for example, I just mentioned the very ideas of sovereignty and the idea of solidarity um, are very Eurocentric, um, Eurocentric enlightenment concepts. And I think we need to think about how we can bring other concepts into 
urban theory, into, into practice. And when we do look closely in Africa, for example, and Latin America, we do find concepts like Buen Vivir or Ubuntu um, that have not been theorized to the same degree as solidarity and sovereignty, but that play a big role, an important role in the way that cities approach the idea of migrant and refugee integration and participation and belonging. Um, another kind of challenge that we need to tackle, I think, is how, we, how can we engage in urban knowledge production um, that kind of migrates from the global south to the global north, because we observe, we have observed, especially in this kind of literature, that um, there has been theories developed on cities, on solidarity cities, sanctuary cities, and so forth in the global north and have been applied in the global south, but not the other way around. So I think this project also gives us an opportunity um, to reverse that direction of theorizing. And I think that might be also an um, an important kind of task and goal for the for the for this kind of literature in um, in general that we need more theorization from the global south. Um, so I'm going to just going to wrap up with the final slide here. So just a, a, a quick summary. First, I offered a fundamental critique um, of the Westphalian system and its controls of human mobility and how sovereignty um, is sort of a tool to, to, um, to control people in the way they move across the surface of the earth, but then also how these controls can serve to enact sovereignty to begin with. That the nation state can say, okay, by controlling people's mobility, I enact myself as a, as a sovereign, um, nation state to begin with. Um, and then I propose that solidarity cities maybe present a different way of thinking about human mobility and can present a, a counter model. In reality, of course, um, both the Westphalian state and solidarity cities, they coexist. It's not either or. Um, so in the real world, um, they need to work together and they are working together right now. An example would be, or an example where it might be not be working so well is Seeplücke, which is largely symbolic because it still requires the nation state approval. Um, the cities in Europe, for example, can't just say, oh, we're accepting these refugees from the Mediterranean um, without the nation state. They still need the approval of the nation state. So it's still this ping pong game also exists not only within these solidarity cities, but also coexist um, uh, between cities and the Westphalian state. But I think what we do need to recognize is that cities are now playing a more assertive role um, in developing, in a way, their own migration um, policies and policies in the way that migrants and refugees are being accommodated and can participate in the city. Um, there are also very interesting geographies of solidarity that come out through um, these kind of ideas of solidarity cities and sanctuary cities that urban solidarity is simultaneously local, but also very transnational in scope. And that I think opens very interesting possibilities um, for new subjectivities and new kinds of politics. So transnational and local um, politics. And then finally, I just wanna caution that I don't want to ro romanticize the role that cities can play in doing good in the world. They can also do equally, um, they're equally powerful to do bad in the world. Um, in other words, uh, urban autonomy can go both ways. Some cities and some actors within even solidarity cities are quite hostile to migrants and refugees and have no objective of inclusion and participation, but quite the opposite. And I think we must remain very critical um, when we, or we should not um, be too quick uh, to reimagine uh, human mobility and, and elevate the city without really um, uh, being also aware that um, this pendulum, this dialectical pendulum can, can swing both ways and it can produce as much harm as good. <clears throat> 
Um, and I'm going to leave it here and I look forward to your questions and discussion.